I'm Dr. Sean Holden and I'm a Senior Lecturer in Computer Science at Cambridge University and Director of Studies in Computer Science at Trinity College, Cambridge. Pretty much just the science and mathematics ones. Um, so I, for a while, was extremely um, enthusiastic about chemistry and uh, thought I might take that route. But um, towards the end of my A-levels, I got more focused on mathematics and um, physics. Uh, and at the time, there was no formal education happening with computers, but the school had a BBC Micro. Um, so I was spending a lot of time during, during lunch breaks and so on, going and playing with that. Um, so it really focused there. And then the aim after that after I got interested in maths and physics was to get into electronics, which is what I then went on to do. I got really heavily interested in science at school, um, and in particular I wanted to go to university to learn electronics, um, because I just had a long-standing fascination for wanting to know how that kind of stuff worked. Um, and by the time I left school, I was lucky to be in the generation that had access for the first time to consumer um, computers. So I'd had a, um, a ZX81 and a Sinclair Spectrum and a Commodore 64 and learned a bit of programming. So I was interested in taking that further as well. So I went to the University of East Anglia to study electronic systems engineering. And so around that time, people were just getting interested in neural networks. Um, and that kind of seemed interesting to me. Um, the idea of making computers that were a bit more like brains. Um, and at the time I'd also just sort of worked out what a PhD was and uh, realised that you could actually uh, go for, towards a career in research. Um, I'd done some industrial placements as an undergraduate and didn't really feel like industry was, uh, was for me at that point. So then I went to Cambridge to do a PhD in engineering. Um, and that was specifically uh, focused on um, a particular kind of neural network. Um, so I spent four years doing a PhD to get a research training. And then I spent a couple of years as a postdoctoral researcher um, and then I got a lectureship, um, and I've been a career academic um, since then. Um, although the, the research that I do has then also led to interaction with more companies than I could uh, probably remember. Um, Autonomy, Rolls-Royce, um, GlaxoSmithKline, y you name it, we, we've worked with all manner of people. So that's, uh, that's, that's brought me here. My research is still on artificial intelligence, so trying to make computers act um, in a more humanly intelligent way, and specifically on machine learning, so trying to write programs that can learn from experience. And we then apply those, at the moment, typically within the realm of biochemistry. Um, before that, we were doing a lot of work on uh, drug design, um, and hence the connections with the pharmaceutical industry. Uh, so we were trying to write programs that could learn by looking at um, existing knowledge about what chemicals have particular interesting properties. Uh, like, for instance, they're not toxic, or that they can cross the barrier between your blood and your brain, which is pretty useful, for instance, if you want to design an antidepressant. Um, so we were looking at software that could learn uh, to recognize those particular kinds of traits in chemicals. And the idea then is that you invent some new chemicals, like thousands of them, and just put them through your software and see if anything is predicted to have the, the properties you want. Um, but more recently we work with biochemists, um, again with similar aims in mind, of uh, understanding disease mechanism and um, developing potentially developing treatments. And for that, we're interested in working out where inside a cell um, proteins are at a particular point in the development of the cell. And that's traditionally been done um, experimentally. 
um, and that's time consuming and difficult but gets you some data. And we've now been looking at using large quantities of data of dubious quality which we can easily um, pull from the internet and trying to use that to augment the good experimental data to try and um, get a, a better prediction of where a particular protein might be at a particular time. Um, so in a nutshell, it's artificial intelligence uh, trying to make software that learns and fairly specifically applied to um, biochemistry and pharmaceuticals. To me, the, the, the artificial intelligence is the, the big um, interesting thing and it's wider than machine learning um, and it's uh, applied all around us in ways we don't necessarily recognise and recently there have been some fairly big step forwards in particular areas of AI and um, I think going forward it's going to be a more and more um, significant part of our lives. But there are also um, attendant problems, um, for example, one reason that artificial intelligence is hard is that the problems you have to solve tend to be what we would call um, computationally intractable, which just means if you're trying to solve a problem and you make the problem just a little bit more complex, the time it takes to solve it goes up by a big factor. So you basically need to multiply the power of your computers over and over again to make little improvements in how complex a problem you can solve. Um, now, traditionally, people haven't been too worried about that because of something called Moore's Law, which uh, tells you that computational power doubles about once every 18 months to two years. But it looks like that's about to run out. Um, things are kind of coming up against the, a stopping point now. Um, and people are having a hard time working out how to keep that increase in computational power going. And so I think the, there's potentially really interesting um, research in uh, computer hardware and how you might um, make uh, processes in a, in a cleverer and more interesting way. Um, I also find the current research in robotics increasingly interesting up until now, if you try, if you look at um, robots that are intended to look human-like, to me they don't really look very human-like at all. They still look extraordinarily artificial, um, and that has a lot to do with just how complicated your face is in terms of the number of tiny little muscles and nerves um, that can be used to give it expression. And there's all manner of interesting research in new materials that can do things like mimic muscle, so contract when you apply a voltage to them. Um, and I, I think the, the research in, in that area in, and in things like making good robotic hands, because again, hands are vastly complicated things and uh, extremely difficult to, to reproduce. I think the, there's the, the, the work going on there is, is tremendously interesting also. Um, but computer science is, is something sufficiently wide that it doesn't really matter which bit of it you pick. That there's something interesting going on. So. I, sh I should give a nod there to all my colleagues who, uh, who do things that I don't, because uh, it's all good stuff. The way that we do this in Cambridge, um, let, let me start by saying how we do it here, because we may be a little unusual. Um, when I do admissions for my college, the main thing that I want to see is really good mathematics. And typically, we, we hope um, to get people who are doing maths and further maths at A level. And that mathematical background is, is really key. Um, maybe not for reasons that are obvious, but that, that reasoning ability is quite important if you want to be doing computer science at the, at the real kind of cutting edge, to use a, a horrible term. Um, now, other scientific subjects are great for, for bolstering that. A lot of our applicants are doing A level physics. Um, some are doing multiple sciences. Um, the computer science A-level, and I need to be specific here, not the IT A-level, um, but the computer science A-level um, is useful to some extent, um, although traditionally we have started our course from scratch 
because some people will come in having done quite a bit of programming and some people will come in having done none. Um, and we need to level the playing field to start with. So a computer science A-level isn't, um, isn't critical. And for us, at the moment, we would probably regard it more, as being more useful to have maths for the maths and physics. Um, but you know, computer science is, is all well and good if you want to do that at A-level. Um, in terms of experience before university, well, any good programming experience you can get is, is, is useful. Um, when I say good programming experience, I kind of mean just actual writing of programs to do things. That's not quite the same thing necessarily as setting up a web page. If you can set up a web page, brilliant, well done. Um, it's a good skill to have. Um, but I'm thinking more in terms of having played around with a, uh, a proper programming language and maybe uh, written a game or something. And anything that's given you a little bit of programming experience is good, but again, we start from scratch and assume you haven't got any. And in fact, we start by teaching a programming language called ML, which most people will never have heard of and which takes a very different approach to the approach that most of the more common programming languages take. And that levels the playing field somewhat between people who've programmed before and people who haven't. Um, and it's also something called a functional programming language and these are becoming increasingly um, uh, he heavily used in industry because they, they have quite a lot of, to recommend them in terms of writing good software quickly. Um, so yeah, I think that, that's, if you, if you want to go into computer science as a career in general, a good degree in computing is a good thing to have. And as a rule, a good technical background in maths and science is, is, the, is the way to get into this. Now, depending on what sort of degree you want to follow, um, there may be universities offering courses with slightly different requirements. Cambridge is unusual in that um, we do teach a fairly um, heavily, uh, I'm not going to say theory oriented, because that tends to give the wrong kind of impression. Um, uh, we tend to teach a course that's fairly um, hot on getting fundamental ideas about computing um, well understood at quite a high level. And the reason for that is that if you're going to do the things like the design of programming languages or safety critical software or um, security critical software um, or very, very large scale software going into the future, um, it's increasingly important that you know the, the foundational underlying ideas of the subject in terms of the theory of computation and computational complexity, logic, um, mathematics that you would use for formally defining a programming language and so on. Um, so we're, we're very heavy on um, trying to teach a computer science degree on that basis that, uh, that will mean you're employable in 20 years time as well as in a year's time. Um, it's possible to do courses on Java programming, for instance, which will make you very employable in the short term, um, but are probably less uh, likely to keep you um, employable long term. And so there, certainly there are other universities with other emphases who may have different entry requirements. But uh, I think being a really good programmer and being really hot at maths is a, is a darn good way to start. Um, if you want to go into industry, uh, Computer science is incredibly employable right now. Um, we, our undergraduates don't really have any problem getting into um, computer science jobs and a lot of them end up going elsewhere. Um, a lot of them end up in the city, for instance. Um, if you want to go into a career in academia, the kind of baseline there is that you would need to do a degree and then a, a doctorate. So that would be another three or four years um, where you specialize in a particular area of computer science and learn to do research. Um, and that tends to be a, a fundamental requirement if you then want to go into academia and do teaching and research. I play uh, in a couple of bands and have done for longer than I'm going to admit to. Um, so I play the drums and guitar and the bazooki and the mandocello and the Irish whistle and a few other bits and pieces as well. Uh, so I play 
um, for a rock band called Underground Zero, which has been uh, around since the 1980s, and which you may have heard of if you're a particularly um, hardcore fan of Hawkwind, because we're on some of the Friends and Relations albums. And the other band is called Cruel Folk, and that's a traditional um, English uh, folk act. Um, so yeah, that's what I do in my spare time. <laughs> Thank you.